I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of John, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We've been doing a study on the book of John. We've been looking at uh, this great gospel that we have in front of us. And last week, we, we looked at a conversation between these two guys, uh, one you might know, his name is Jesus, uh, and the other guy who was named Nicodemus. This was uh, kind of like a face-off, a religious face-off, kind of like a, like a showdown or a debate, if you will, between these two great teachers of that time. Nicodemus was known as a leader in that time, and he was facing off against this new teacher, Jesus Christ. And so after Jesus has a conversation with him, and he tells him all about this new life that is going to be found in him, he wins this debate. But instead of boasting, like any of us would do, right? I mean, how many of you guys have ever like won a basketball game or won a debate or, or t- tore somebody down? You're like, yeah, I won, right? Yeah, yeah. But in very Jesus fashion, instead of glorifying himself and boasting, He doesn't declare his victory, he declares his death. I want to read that passage to you. It's found in John chapter 3. I'm going to be looking at verses 16 through 21 here this morning. John 3, 16. You may have heard of it before, maybe once or twice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that through the world might be saved, so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God. Let us pray. God, we thank you this morning again for your word. We ask you that you may use it uh, to challenge us. Lord, as your word says, that it may Uh, rebuke, correct, admonish us, and train us in righteousness, Lord. We ask you that it may penetrate our hearts and divide our soul, our spirit, joints and marrows, and the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. May it bring us to conviction, repentance, adoration, and thanksgiving. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated, those of you guys who are in the back. uh, We are going to be talking about this message, and the title of today's message is step into the light. Step into the light. You know, as I was considering this passage and I was thinking about what would be a good illustration or a good way to kind of help you understand this passage better, I was reminded of this story that many of you might be familiar with. I understand some of you might not be. Uh, And that's a story of the emperor's new clothes. Are you guys familiar with it? Show of hands, how many of you guys have heard the story? A few of us. Okay, good. Not the Emperor's New Groove. That's completely different, all right? That's Cusco, and that's a completely different. This is the Emperor's New Clothes. Now, for those of you guys who are not familiar with the story, the story goes a little bit like this. There once was an emperor in this great kingdom, and he ruled. This was a very wise, he was a very knowledgeable emperor, and he also loved fashion. How many of you guys love fashion? I see some good, what do you guys call it, fits? I see some good fits. It's like Easter, you guys are ready for Easter morning. Look, afterwards, we're going to have a, a photo booth outside. So you guys could even remember the moment by taking a picture in a photo booth outside of your fits this morning. But this guy, he loved showing off his fits. He loved showing off his glorious robes and how good of sense of fashion that he had. Now, one day, these two scoundrels came into this city, into this, em- to this empire, and they presented themselves as weavers. I don't know if you guys know what a weaver is, but a weaver is somebody who makes different clothes. And they convinced the emperor that they were the best weavers in any land. They were the best at making clothes. They had made the finest kinds of clothes ever imaginable. And if the king would, be, would allow them to make some clothes for him, it would be the greatest garments he would have ever 
born. Now, these scoundrels were trying to deceive them. As a matter of fact, they didn't know how to make clothes. They just pretended to. But they had convinced the king that they knew best. And here's how they convinced him. They told him that this fine linen that they were about to use, this fine uh, thread that they were about to use, could only be seen by the wisest people, by the people who deserve their position, for those who merited their role in their kingdom, in their position, they would only be the ones to be able to see this thread. And so the king commissioned them, okay, start making some of this clothes. Start, and they, they went and they started, they started pretending to weave this fabric. Now, at first, it looked a little bit ridiculous because they were not working with anything. It was this invisible thread that they were working on, and, and he's, the king says, hey, you know what? I don't know if I'm ready to go check out what they're working on. I don't know if I'm ready. He was kind of doubtful about his position. And so he's like, you know, I'm going to send one of my most trusted advisors, a guy who I know deserves his position, to go see if he can see the thread. And so he sends his, his advisor, and that guy goes, and he checks out the thread, and Lo and behold, when he gets there, he sees nothing. There's nothing there. And so the, the, the weavers were saying, yeah, but look, if, look at how great, look at the great, the patterns, and look at the colors. Look at how beautiful this is. If you truly are meriting your position, if you truly are wise, you'd be able to see all of this. And the advisor was kind of like, ah, I don't want to tell the king that I can't see it. I don't want to admit that I don't deserve my position. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, of course, I see the pattern. Yeah, beautiful colors, awesome, amazing, glorious pattern. And he goes back to the king and he says, yeah, king, you know what? I saw it. I saw the, the, the pattern, the thread. And the king's like, oh, okay, 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 okay. So he sends another advisor to go check it out. And this person too goes and he's like, there's nothing here. But that other guy said he saw something. And they're saying that he saw something. Ugh maybe I'm not deserving of my position. And yet, he's like, you know what? I don't want to admit that I can't see it. I don't want to admit that I can't, I, I, I don't belong in this position that I'm in. And so he too goes back. And he says, yeah, beautiful robes, amazing, beautiful color, awesome. And he goes and he tells the king. The king's finally convinced. He says, you know what? I got to check this out myself. And so he goes with his advisors and they all go to check it out. And the weavers are like, look, we finished this great robe for you. And the king is shocked when he gets here. Why? Because the king could see nothing. But yet, his advisors both saw something. The people saw something. And so he didn't want to look bad in front of anybody else. And so he said, oh, yeah, beautiful clothes, amazing. Of course, I'm the king. I could see all of this, right? I'm going to wear it. And so he put his faith and he put his trust in these liars. And what happens is he had so much faith in these people that he wore these invisible robes and he went to go show the city. Ah, uh, you know what happens next, right? He goes in front of the city and he flaunts his glorious clothing that him and his advisors could see. And everybody knew about these weavers. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, we could, we could see it. We could all. Nobody wanted to admit that they couldn't see a thing. Until a little boy came up. And he looks at the king. And he says, the king is naked. The king is not wearing anything. And at that moment, the words of this little boy changed the mindsets of everybody else and helped them to realize that, hey, you know what? He's been deceived. The king is naked. Everybody realized. Now, here's the thing about the king. He had to make a choice. At this point, he either had to admit that he was full, or he had to hide his nakedness from everybody else. Now, what does this story have to do with the gospel, Easter Sunday? What do we have to do here with this passage that we just read? Well, here's what I want you guys to realize. You see, we have all bought into this lie that we need to earn, that we need to merit this great gift of God of salvation. 
We have been lied to from the very beginning and ever since we were born that if we are good enough, if we do good things, if we are able to merit our salvation, if we're able to, to pray, if we go to church enough, if we are passionate about God, then you know what? We will merit this great salvation. You might be sitting in here this morning, and you might be a Christian. You might be saved. You might have understood the gospel. And yet you think to yourself, yes, I'm here. But do I really deserve the salvation that I have? I think this is a reality in many of our lives, myself included. There's been periods in my life where I've thought to myself, am I worthy to be a Christian? Am I worthy to be saved? Have I done enough good things for God to look upon me and say, good job? I think many of us think that way. I think today, especially out of many days, uh, people all over the city are attending church. Maybe you're here because you believe that your attendance to church today will somehow merit you points with God. Sometimes we think that maybe just in, in, in attending or, or going somewhere, that we somehow have earned the love of God. And yet what we see in this passage is that we have been swindled. We have been deceived. And we recognize through this passage that salvation is not based on anything that you can do. It is simply based on everything that Jesus has done. As we look at the words of this passage, we see this great truth. John is painting this picture of this great love and salvation that is offered by God, and he explains to us how to receive this salvation. How do we receive this salvation? This is our big idea, our big point. If you want to write it down or take a picture of it, it is this. God's plan of salvation is received by those who in faith step into the light of Christ. God's plan of salvation is received by those who in faith step into the light of Christ. This text, it's a very familiar text. As I told you, it comes on the heels of a conversation that Jesus just had with this guy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus thought he knew everything. Let me tell you, if anybody deserves salvation, it was that guy, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader he was a teacher in Israel. He knew all of these things. He came from a very wealthy and prominent family. Let me tell you, if anybody deserves salvation, it was Nicodemus. And yet Jesus tells Nicodemus that in order for him to be saved, it wasn't going to require all of his accolades, all of his accomplishments, who he was, but it was going to require faith in Jesus Christ for him to believe in the Son of God. And what's amazing is, that at the moment of victory, where Jesus stumps Nicodemus, because Nicodemus didn't understand a thing, Jesus proclaims his victory, and yet he proclaims his victory through his death. Look at what it says here in the verse right before, in verses 14 and 15. Right after he wins the argument, Jesus says this, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man talking about himself must be lifted up. Here he's talking about the cross. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life in him. Jesus says, Nicodemus, my victory will come through my shame. Your victory, Nicodemus, will come through Jesus' sacrifice. Instead of gloating in victory, he gloats in shame. Why? Because in his shame, he is able to accomplish victory. Now, we get a little bit of an explanation. Many people argue whether this is still Jesus speaking or whether this is the disciple John speaking. Most people believe that this is John the disciple speaking. He wants to clarify for you and for me, for the readers, what is Jesus talking about? What does he mean by he will be lifted up and whoever believes in him will be saved. And now we get this explanation, kind of like a, like a director's cut. Have you ever seen a movie with like a director's cut where he kind of like gives you some information at the, at the back end, like, oh, this happened because of this. This is what's happening in this text. John is giving us a director's cut of this conversation. Look at what he says here in verse 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that so, I keep messing up this word, but so that the world might be saved through him. We see here in this point that God's mission of salvation is motivated by love. That's our first point, our point that we're going to write down. God's mission of salvation is motivated by love. Now, what does this mean that it's motivated by love? He announces his death, yes, that he is going to die, but he also announces this mission that God had sent him in. Now, why is his death so important? Why is the death of Jesus part of the mission? Well, as we talked about in Good Friday, it is the death of Jesus, the perfect man, who is able to pay for our sins because he takes his perfection places it upon us, he takes our sin, places it upon himself, and now he is able to pay for our sins through his sacrifice on the cross. That's payment of sin. That's part of the mission that Jesus came to do. But what is this mission motivated by? Is it motivated by duty? Is it an obligation that God has to his people? Well, no, we see that this is motivated strictly, uniquely, by love, the love that God has for the world. I think this is amazing. It's amazing to look at this passage and be able to recognize that it is because of love that we have been saved. Isn't it good to hear, I love you? How many of you guys like to hear that, that, I, that somebody loves you? I, I think we all appreciate that, right? When somebody tells us that they love us, that they care for us, that, we're think, that they're thinking of us, Love is a powerful thing. And yet, sometimes we tend to confuse this idea of love. Why? Because we think that people will love us if we are lovable, right? And sometimes that kind of extends to God. And we tend to think, yes, we appreciate God loves us. God loves me so much. I love it. And we kind of hold on to that. God loves me. God sent his son for me. All of this is true. And yet, we kind of start thinking to ourselves, you know what? Maybe God loves me because I deserve to be loved. That could be a false thinking. Why? Because let me remind you that it is not because you are worthy of God's love, but because of his choice to love you. I'll give you an illustration. I have three kids. Sometimes my kids do things that are not very lovely. Things that don't make me love them more, right? They test my patience. They look at my face and in rebellion do the thing that I told them not to do. Especially uh, you guys, some of you guys know my children. They'll look at me and I'll tell them, hey, stop doing that. And they'll look at me and they'll do it one more time, right? Like they're obeying, but they're going to do it just one more, just to test to see how far they can go. Oh, Kids are sometimes not lovable, but I love them. You see the difference? I choose to love my children not because they have portrayed some, some sort of um, loveliness in them. Yes, yeah, sometimes they do things that are cute. Sometimes they come and they hug me and they say, Happy Easter, Dad. I'm so glad that you're here. They'll hug me and they'll kiss me. And they... I love those moments. But sometimes they'll come to me and ask me that one question that they always ask me. Where's mom? Right? Like that, that's, that's their question. Where's mom? Right? Like, hi, yeah, whatever, dad. Where's mom? I need, like, that's their, that. sometimes we're like that as well. Right? We don't do things that are lovable to God. We don't behave in ways that God would look at us and say, you know what? Lewis is worthy to be loved. You know what? Lewis has earned my love today. That is not how God operates. See, God loves us despite our rebellion, despite our sins, despite the fact that we have turned against him and made ourselves rulers of our lives. God's love is not conditional upon our actions. It is conditional upon himself. And so God loves the world. God loves us so much that he gives his one and only son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, don't get this confused because sometimes when we read this, we look at ourselves as the main character of the story, right? It's like God loves me. The Bible is about me. God wants to bless me. Uh -uh. The Bible's not about you. The Bible's about God. The Bible's about his holy name, and it's about his love. It is the work he has done. We can't earn his love. As a matter of fact, you want to have some proof and some evidence that we can't earn his love. Here's what the Bible says about you before you were saved. Look at what Ephesians chapter 2 says here. Ephesians 2 verses 3 starts like this. Among them, we too, talking about Christian, all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, the desires of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature, this is who we are by nature, children of wrath. We deserve the wrath and the justice of God, just like the rest. So what gets us out of this wrath Fullness, this, this, this deserving of, of, of wrath. What gets us from that point to now being children of God? Nothing we did. Look at the next verse, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy. Why? Because of his great love, which he loved us. Even when, when we were dead in our sins and our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. Not only that, oh, here we go. Easter's coming, huh? And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The role of God in this salvation is to give you his love, to give you his affection, to save you, to raise you up, all for his glorious name, so that everyone would look at our lives and say, not how great you are, but how great God is. And so we see that this salvation is motivated by love. And so I encourage you that if you're in here today, and the reason why you're in here today is to try to earn God's favor, to try to earn points in heaven, to try to, to get God to, to, be, to be on the good side of God, listen, that is not the motivation that you should have. It is not based on anything that we've done. It is based on what Christ has already done for us. See, the works don't precede the faith. The works come after faith. Yes, we live and we come to church and we glorify and we honor God because we have a relationship with him, not because we have a duty. And so we are, this salvation is motivated by love. The second thing that we see in this text is this. God's salvation is received by faith in Jesus. How do we receive this great love? Well, it is through faith in Jesus. Let's look at verse 18 here. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, this is a narrowing of the focus. We begin, for God so loved the what? The world. But now, in verse 18, he focuses on the one. Well, why? Well, because even though God's offer of salvation is for the world, not everyone in the world will be saved. This is, this is contrary to many people's ideas that all paths lead to God. Many people believe that if you believe in one religion or another religion, it doesn't matter why, because at the end of the day, all roads lead to heaven, right? Well, let me tell you the truth of what the Bible says. God revealing himself to us, not all roads lead to heaven. As a matter of fact, there's two roads, a wide road that leads to destruction and a narrow road that leads to life, and only few find it. And that road is Jesus Christ. Look at this verse again. Verse 18, we see that this salvation is for those who believe. Believe. 
Now, why, pastor, did you write it as faith and not belief? Why didn't you use the actual word that was there? Because I said God's salvation is received by faith in Jesus. Well, because in our vocabulary, belief and faith can kind of mean two separate things, right? To believe in something sometimes in in our mindset means to uh, mentally assert that something is true, right? Like if if you believe in something, you kind of like think it to be true. But faith goes a step further, right? Faith is putting your trust in that something. As a matter of fact, as you look at that word in the original language, it doesn't just have the, the, the connotation of, of, of believing or understanding that something is true, but it is actually putting your trust into something. Namely, in this text, is putting your trust into Jesus. It's kind of like the emperor that we talked about in the beginning, right? What if he would have just simply believed that what they were saying was true? If he would have just believed that what they were saying was true, but had no faith in them, do you think he would have stepped out into the public? Probably. I mean, how many of you guys would step out naked into the public? I mean, it's kind of weird. I mean, if, if you're into that, like, we'll have an offer of salvation later on, right? <laughs> and so, so, he, so here's the thing. He probably wouldn't have gone out into the public. Why? Because he wouldn't have had faith that what they were saying was true. But in his heart, He truly believed, he had faith and confidence, and so his belief dictated his actions. And so he steps out in faith into this world. Same thing with you guys, right? How many of you guys tested the chairs before you sat down today? I don't think any of you guys, right? You had faith that the chairs would hold you. You believed, based on previous evidence, that chairs, at least in church, can hold you up, right? And so you put your faith in what you believe in. And so in the same way, we see in this text that it is not just mentally asserting and saying, yeah, I believe that Jesus is God, but it's now living your life like you believe. It is now your life looking like you believe in Jesus Christ. There needs to be uh, an action that is motivated by your beliefs. You are to do the very thing that you say that you believe in. And what is it that we need to believe in in order for us to be saved, to have this offer of salvation? Well, it is in the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. See, you might convince yourself that there are other ways to salvation. You might think, you know what? I kind of believe that at the end of the day, there might be different ways. Like, we'll never fully know. How will you know if your faith was founded on something real? In this world, you, you don't really know, right? Like, when is the moment where you're gonna write, where you're gonna find out for sure whether your faith in Jesus was true? The day of death, right? The day of judgment. You're gonna see is if your faith was placed in something valid or not. You know, this past week we went out to FIU. Uh, a group of us went to go evangelize to to FIU, and we went on Tuesday night. It was a great great moment. Uh, it was uh, powerful. Uh, we were able to pray with some people. Uh, one person actually accepted the Lord Jesus. It was awesome. And uh, let me tell you, though, the questions that we asked were kind of helping them understand and trying to help us to see what our world thinks about God. One of the questions that was there is, what do you think happens after death? What do you think happens when you die? Now, you might have a variety of answers. I pray that most of you guys will recognize that there will be a moment of judgment. And that's what we saw. A lot of people said, I don't know. A lot of people said, nothing. Some people said, judgment. Now, it's important to know that what's coming, but it's also important to know what side of the equation do you land on, right? I don't know if you guys have ever been to a, like a like court. Have you ever been in a, in a, a, a judgment seat? I, I know I got, a, a, I got some speeding tickets earlier in my life, right? And I was always there with the uncertainty of what's going to happen. Is the police officer going to show up? Am I going to get the ticket? Am I not, right? It's this uncertainty. How many of you guys like showing up to a judge and waiting for things to happen to see whether you're going to be guilty or not? I, I, that would make us completely nervous, right? We wouldn't want to be in that situation. But how would you feel about walking into that judgment with the assurance of knowing the outcome? Oh, that would be completely different, right? And so 
Jesus tells, or John tells us in this passage, what is your judgment going to be based on? What is your judgment going to be based on? And really, there's two choices here. It's not multiple choices. It's not all roads lead to heaven. Two choices. He says this. The one who believes in him is not judged or is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been judged already. Huh. What does that mean? What do you mean has been judged already? Well, let me tell you from the beginning of time, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What do we deserve? We deserve judgment and punishment and the wrath of God. That is what we deserve. Why? Because we're all sinners. The, 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 the standard is perfection. And unless I'm in a weird room, I don't think any of you are perfect, right? Nobody? None of us? Okay, good. Good. So that's the standard. And so I'm talking to a group of people who, by nature, you deserve wrath. You've been judged already. But this free gift, this free offer of salvation is that for those who believe in him will not be judged. Let me ask you a question. What are you trusting in today? Are you trusting in the work of Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in your own efforts? Are you trusting in in your own works, in your own goodness? Have you bought into the lie to think to yourself, that you deserve salvation from God, that you're worthy of being saved because of what you've done? Or have you just thought to yourself, you know what? I don't really want to deal with this whole salvation thing, this judgment thing, and so I'm just not going to believe in the judgment, right? Let me get spoiler. There is already judgment whether you believe in it or not, right? And so whether you believe in Jesus Christ or you believe there is no judgment, you are placing your faith in something. Faith is, your faith is placed in something, whether it's in Jesus or what the world tells you or what your friend tells you, your faith is placed in something. Is your belief that there will be salvation apart from Jesus? If it is, then the Bible is clear. You have been judged already. There's only one way for salvation to come, and it is for those who believe in Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. The third point I want to make here is this last point. God's light, Jesus, gives us new life. God's light, Jesus, gives us new life. This calls back the pro, from the prologue what John had already said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he talks about light and darkness, and the light has come into this world, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so he goes back to the same imagery that he used before. Look at this next verse here. Look at verse 19. It says, and this is the judgment. This is what the judgment is going to be based on. The light has come into the world. Talking about Jesus. But he says, and the people love darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices truth comes into the light so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed by God. So you might ask yourself if this judgment uh, is if, if this judgment is based on belief and faith, then why don't people just believe? Why are we walking in a world where more and more people are disbelieving in Jesus Christ and turning away from him? Why is it that people are rejecting this light and instead embracing the darkness? Because people love darkness. People love to be hidden in their sins. Let me tell you, when you are in your sins... It's hard to come out of them. Why? Because you got to admit that you're a sinner. That's what it takes. You have to recognize that you are a sinner. Stepping out into the light will expose you of your sins. Will, will people will look at you and say, hey, look, you know what? That guy, he's a sinner. Let me tell you, it's hard to step out in the light when you're in sin. 
But you know what? It's not just sinfulness. It's also this mindset that you're good enough. What do I mean by that? Well, this lie that I talked to you about in the beginning, that we're worthy of our calling, is the same lie that I think is a structure into our society today, right? Why? Because none of us want to look bad in front of anybody else, right? You look at other people and you don't want that shame of people thinking you're not good. I mean, you look around in this room and you look at other people and sometimes Christians portray themselves in this perfect light, right? Like, I'm perfect, you're perfect, can we all just pretend like we're perfect? And if we all pretend like we're perfect, you know what will happen? People will think we're perfect. And in the inside, we're all broken. In the inside, we recognize how much sin and despair there is in us. Listen, we need to stop pretending because I'm a sinner as much as you are. We are all sinners. And salvation isn't based on who is less of a sinner than somebody else. It is based on who will be able to step into the light of Jesus and say, you know what? I'm a sinner. And I need to be forgiven. See, what prevents us from salvation is many times not just sin having a hold on us, but it is our pride thinking that we can do this on our own. Thinking that we can earn God's salvation on our own. But yet, this passage is clear. People will not step into the light because of fear that their deeds will be exposed. Again, spoiler alert, we already know you're a sinner. We all are, right? You don't need to hide it. We all recognize that we sin and we fall short. But it is when we step into the light that our life is transformed. I want to go back to this illustration for a moment. This king, this emperor, believed that this lie was true. He believed that he would have been wise enough if he deserved his position, he would see the clothes. Same lie that we've been told all of our lives. But as he walks out in front of everybody, everybody's able to see his guilt and his shame. Number one, that he was fooled. Number two, that if the guys were right, then he wasn't wise enough or he didn't merit his position. And yet, he believed so much that he stepped into the light. Now, it would be hard for us to step into the light recognizing that we're sinners. But what we see here in this text is a little different than our story in the beginning. Why? Well, because the promise of those who step into the light isn't guilt and shame, but rather those who step into the light will be clothed in righteousness. See, Jesus is the one who took our guilt and our shame. He is the one who was displayed naked on a cross, who bore our sins, who put his shame for every one of us to no longer be shamed. He is the one who stood in front of everybody, and he was able to take our sin and our guilt, and he nailed it to the cross. But what we realize is that through Sunday morning, through Resurrection Sunday, that that sin and that guilt is now replaced by his righteousness. I want you to look at this verse again here in verse 21. It's interesting because it kind of, it might lead us to believe that, wait a minute, I thought you just said those who do good deeds don't merit anything. And this verse says, but the one who practices truth comes into the light. So wait a minute, are you saying that only if I'm good can I walk into the light? No, 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 no. Look at the rest of the verse. So that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed what? In God. See, when we step into the light, our deeds now change. They are now done by God in and through us. I want to give you another passage here to kind of help solidify this idea, and it is Philippians 3. It's an awesome passage about how God takes our guilt and our shame, and he instead changes it for his righteousness. Look at what it says here, Philippians 3. Verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, in other words, my accomplishments, who I am, my pedigree, everything that I've done, whatever was gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. Why? More than that, I count 
all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Verse 9 says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, deriving from the law or from the good deeds that I've done, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so the image that we have here is that those who believe and place their faith in Christ say, hey, you know what? I am a sinner. Hey, you know what? I have failed God. Hey, you know what? I'm not worthy of his love. Hey, you know what? I don't deserve his salvation. And you step into the light and you say, God, I don't deserve this. God, forgive me. God, save me. And instead of standing naked and ashamed in front of everybody else, God's light clothes you with righteousness, and he welcomes you into his family. He welcomes you into into the faith, and you are now part of his kingdom, not in nakedness and shame, but robed in righteousness. That is the salvation of God. God's plan of salvation is received by those who in faith step into the light. And so I ask you this morning, where are you? Are you still living in darkness? Are you in belief and not faith? Are you mentally asserting and and, and thinking that your salvation is based on anything that you have done? Or are you willing to surrender and place your faith in Jesus Christ and say, God, I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize I've fallen short. God, redeem me. God, heal me. Clothe me in righteousness. I want to be loved like your son. If that's you this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray to God and ask him for forgiveness and to repent. Listen, stepping into the light takes faith. Stepping into the light is not easy. And so I encourage you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, you may be encouraged to step into the light and find salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy upon us. Lord, as we have read this passage this morning, as we have seen this great gift, this great love that you've had for us, Lord, help us to recognize that we are in sin and we are in shame. Lord, help us to step into the light. Help us to realize that apart from you, we're nothing. We're not lovable. We don't do things that deserve your love. But as your word says in Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we recognize that this morning. We recognize that We can't make it to you on our own efforts. And so you sent your son, Jesus Christ, on a mission to die for us. God, we thank you for this eternal mission that you prepared. God, we thank you for this great salvation that you have offered us in your son, Jesus. Lord, it is available to all who believe. God, I pray that today would be the day that you give us the faith to believe the faith to step into the light and to say, I am a sinner in need of salvation. God, clothe me with your righteousness. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation in Christ. Give me eternal life. God, we want to live for you. As we said earlier in the the service, salvation and eternal life isn't just an eternity with you in heaven. It is a relationship with you today. You have given us life and life to the fullest. We now have eternal life. God, I pray for those who are in here this morning who may not know you, who may be far away from you, who may not have repented from their sins, who may have thought that they were doing enough to merit salvation. God, I pray that today would have been a day of conviction, that you help them to realize that it is nothing that they can do, but it is everything that you have done through Jesus Christ. 
I pray that this morning you would encourage them and that you would challenge them to repent from their sins. God, I pray for those who are already saved, those who might already be part of your family, Lord, and yet they might be lurking into the shadows back once again. They might think that this Christian life is a life of perfection, and yet they're ashamed of their sinfulness. God, let this be a place where shame and guilt is no longer something that we put as a burden on people, but we recognize that we are all sinners, God, that we all fall short, and that, yes, we are going to mess up, but it is through repentance and faith and confession of our sins that you offer us forgiveness again and again and again. And so, God, this morning we confess our sins. Those who are already in you and who believe in you and who are walking in faith are on that narrow road, but yet have sin in their lives. God, we confess that we are sinners. We want to bring those sins into the light. Not so that they could be exposed for shame, but so that they could be exposed to you for redemption. God, help us to be redeemed this morning. We thank you, Lord praise you. And it is through this living hope that we have in you that we can say and sing praises to you this morning. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, if that is you, if you made that choice today, if it's the first time you have ever heard the gospel, you realize that today is a day you need to repent and come into the light, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you this morning. Maybe you're watching us online and you are praying that prayer. You're saying, it's me, Pastor. I want to step into the light. I want to repent for my sins. I want to live for Christ. If that's you, let us know in the comments so that we can connect with you and help you to walk in Christ. Now, if you're in here, I I pray that we're all going to meet in heaven, that we're all going to be part of this great congregation in heaven. But you might be in here and you might have that moment where you recognize that you've kind of been living in the shadows. Maybe you need to pray. Maybe you need to connect with somebody. I, I, I ask you to connect with one of our leaders later on today at, at the end of the service and help us to, to know how we can pray for you, how to connect you with one another. And finally, I want to invite you to always be part of our church. Why? Well, because God doesn't call us to live just in a connection with him and us alone, but it is a connection with one another. We are together children of God. You're not an only child, all right? You are part of a bigger family, a church of Christ, and we are to do this together. And so I invite you to come back next week as we continue to worship God. I'm going to invite you to stand up at this time. Let's close our service off in some worship.